We'll continue our worship now through the preaching of God's Word. Please have and keep your Bibles open with me to Matthew chapter 5. We'll continue on in our series on the Sermon on the Mount this morning. We started this journey some uh, probably three or four months back now, and I'm, I'm so thankful that Paul was able to read and, and remind us of this whole first portion of the chapter of chapter five, the first portion of the, the Sermon on the Mount. The first 16 verses, we've actually affectionately come to, to call them the, the Beatitudes. Everyone knows these verses as the Beatitudes. And now, this sermon, the, the Lord's Sermon on the Mount, is by far His most famous sermon, and that's primarily because of its content. Right? Passages like the Lord's Prayer, for example, are all found in this sermon. And as we walked through last time, if, if you were to summarize this entire sermon in just two words, this sermon, the Sermon on the, Round, on the Mount, really is about kingdom life. It's about kingdom living. Now, there are three parts to Jesus' sermon here, and they all point towards this same theme, kingdom life. We have the Beatitudes describing what kingdom citizens look like. Those are the first 16 verses that Paul read for us this morning. The middle part of the sermon is from, verse, from uh, chapter 5, verse 17, all the way through to chapter Chapter twelve, uh, chapter seven, verse twelve, and that is the 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 description of how kingdom citizens ultimately should live in the kingdom. And then Jesus closes off his sermon with three warnings about the kingdom. Three warnings about the kingdom. The, the warning of the wrong entrance. You have the wide and the narrow gate. You have the warning of false teachers, the, the wolf in sheep's clothing. And you have the warning of a false profession with the parable of the two builders. <clears throat> So kingdom life is the, the theme of, of Jesus' sermon. As we, as we looked at last time, when we talk about the kingdom, we know because of what Jesus said to Pilate in John 18, Chad just took us through this passage, that, that, that we, we know that this is a, a spiritual kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world. But when we talk also about the kingdom, we have to look at passages like Colossians 1.13. Paul gives us this insight into what the kingdom is. He says, God rescued us from the domain of darkness, from the kingdom over which Satan is king and Satan reigns. And God transferred us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son, over which Christ reigns and rules. So when we talk about kingdom life, there are two kingdoms to be concerned about. The kingdom of life, the kingdom of light, and the kingdom of darkness over which Satan reigns. Everyone here this morning, you either belong to either one of these kingdoms. There's no, there's no other option. You are either in the domain of Satan and darkness, or you are in the kingdom of God's beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we are born into this world, we are all born into the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom over which Satan reigns. But by God's grace, he transfers some of us out of that kingdom and into the kingdom of light, the kingdom over which Christ is Lord, Lord the kingdom over which Christ reigns. And notice what Paul says in that passage. This transfer does not take place by our own doing. Rather, it's through the, the power of God, through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's through the work of the Holy Spirit in drawing us to the Father. We are in the kingdom of darkness because of our sin, because of our rebellion against God. We are born sinners. But God, being rich in mercy because of His great love for us, not because of anything I could do or you could do, he saved us, Ephesians 2. He drew us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And in these first 16 verses, we have these eight beatitudes this morning, eight qualities that define the character of those who are truly Jesus' spiritual subjects, those who are in his spiritual kingdom. 
If you want to know this morning, if you are a true believer, if you want assurance that you truly belong to Jesus Christ and are a part of his kingdom, then you need to shine the torch of these eight beatitudes over your soul and see if you can see these qualities shining forth in your life. Because these eight beatitudes describe all true believers. All eight beatitudes describe all Christians. You can't say, well, okay, I'm pretty good on the first three, but the rest of them I'm a little off. No, all true believers will be described by all eight of these qualities. That's one great thing about the Beatitudes is that they don't leave any wiggle room for sin. They don't leave any room for excuses in our life. When it comes to kingdom life, as we said, there's only an A or a B choice. You either belong to Jesus' spiritual kingdom or you still belong to Satan's kingdom. And these eight Beatitudes, these eight qualities in the first part of the sermon describe those who are in Jesus' kingdom. Now, if you remember back to our previous sermon, the word that Jesus uses here to describe each of these eight Beatitudes is the word blessed. The word blessed. And as we looked at last time, that word doesn't just mean happy. Jesus is using an Old Testament concept here that doesn't describe this emotional state of of happiness, but rather it describes a a person who is in an objective state of spiritual well-being. Blessed means that, that this is someone experiencing a state of enviable spiritual health and well-being. That is the the blessed person. It's Jesus' way of basically saying, these people, they're in my kingdom. They're right with God. They're true believers. They enjoy a condition of spiritual health. As we started out, we we looked at the first two of these Beatitudes. Verse 3 is the first one. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This beatitude really is the the overarching theme for the entire sermon. And every true believer has an awareness of their own spiritual bankruptcy. Of their own spiritual poverty before God. That word is used elsewhere in the scriptures to describe someone who is a beggar. And that's how every true Christian ultimately should see themselves. They should see that they have absolutely nothing to offer God and they come to him in all humility, begging for salvation. In fact, no one can ever get into Jesus' spiritual kingdom until they come to realize they have nothing they can offer. Either Even the best of our works are but a filthy rag before a holy God. No amount of good works can ever make us acceptable to a good and a perfect and a holy God. The only way we get into the kingdom is by coming as a beggar. The second beatitude we looked at together was verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So not only is every true believer aware of their spiritual poverty, but also every true believer mourns over their poverty. Every true believer mourns over sin in their life. They mourn the fact that they have missed the mark of God's perfection. And it grieves them that they cannot possibly be saved other than through God's graciousness in their life. And this person, Jesus says, will enjoy a future comfort of eternal joy in the presence of God. This morning we'll be looking at the third beatitude found in Matthew 5 verse 5. And it says, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Or blessed are the gentle for they shall inherit the earth. The other night, uh, Nia and I were driving home from uh, from somewhere together. And we were talking about um, this sermon coming up and, and in particular this word and while we're driving, Nia found this, this website, and it was, a, it was a website that offered training in assertiveness. 
And uh, so I, I, I was, my interest was intrigued and I started looking it up and it turns out there's lots of different websites like that that you can, you can take these classes to help you become more assertive. Straight away, a part of me was thinking, well, I didn't even realize that that was even a problem. <laughs> I mean, I have five people in my family and I reckon there's 10 opinions on everything that we do. No one has a problem being assertive in my house, myself included. But apparently this is a, a problem in the world around us today. One of the training websites said this about their assertiveness class. He said, our assertiveness training teaches you how to become more confident and how to cope with other people's negativity. Our training empowers you with the ability to express your rights and opinions without violating the rights and opinions of others. So, you can take a class on that and feel free to uh, look into it if you like. But, but that's really the way that the world thinks today, isn't it? I mean, in order to get by in society today, in order to be successful, we're told that we have to be the loudest. We're told we have to be the most assertive. In order to be successful by the world's standards, we have to be one that steps on other people's toes. The world says it's, it's survival of the fittest. We see this even with these minority ideologies that represent less than the 1%. They seem to have the loudest voice in our country at the moment. They do, what, they, they do whatever they have to do to make their rights and opinions heard above all else. The world says, if you want to get somewhere, if you want to get to the top, you've got to make yourself heard and you've got to assert yourself above all other people, no matter what the cost. The reality is, though, that this kind of worldly assertiveness is exactly the opposite of what we are to be as Christians. And it's the exact issue that Jesus deals with here this morning in this third beatitude. You want to know if you are truly in Jesus' spiritual kingdom? Then you will display a heart of meekness. It's really that simple. If you, if, you, if you want to know that you are in the kingdom, you will display a heart of meekness. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, if this beatitude sounds familiar to you, there's a, there's a reason for that. It's because Jesus actually takes this or bases this beatitude upon Psalm 37, verse 11 in which David is encouraging the, the Israelites with the exact same thing. He says, the meek will inherit the land. Now really, to, to learn what our, our Lord meant in this beatitude, again, we're going to split it up like we have previously in two different halves. We're going to ask two questions of our text this morning. Firstly, we're going to ask, what does it mean to be meek? What does it mean to, to show meekness? And secondly, we're going to ask the question, what does it mean that the meek will inherit the earth? So what does it mean to be meek? And what does it mean that the meek will inherit the earth? That first question, though, what does meek mean? What is the meaning of, of meekness or, or gentleness? Some of you might have gentleness in your Bibles this morning. Before we look at what it does mean, one thing I found really helpful with these Beatitudes is to, is to really clear the air before we get into it and look what it doesn't mean. There are a lot of bad ideas floating around about the Beatitudes, and so I think it's really important to, to clear the air and look at what meekness doesn't mean so we can start to build off of that foundation. So first of all, meekness does not mean cowardice or lack of conviction. Often when we think of this, this word, we, we kind of get a picture of somebody like that, somebody who's a little more timid, a little more reserved, a little more quiet. But Jesus was described as being meek, and he was anything but a coward. He was anything but lacking in conviction. Jesus went to the cross for what he believed in. 
Secondly, meekness is, is not a willingness to have peace at any cost. There are some people that, that take this idea about, about meekness and, 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 and they use it to say, well, we just got to get along. We've got to use it to be accepting of others, no matter the, the compromises that, that we have to make. Well, that's not biblical meekness either. Thirdly, meekness is not indecisiveness or lack of confidence or weakness in character. Understand this, meekness is not weakness. The meek person can both be gentle, but at the same time be courageous as a lion when it comes to the cause of God or to the cause of others. I think a perfect example of this is is the man Moses. Just think No man can truly be a wimp and lead two million Israelites for 40 years in the desert. So meekness is not weakness. And fourthly, meekness is not just human shyness or or an introverted personality or or just human niceness. Martin Lloyd-Jones writes, There are people who seem to be born naturally nice. But that is purely biological. One dog is nicer than another. One cat is nicer than another. That is not biblical meekness. So if none of those things are meekness, then what exactly is this quality? Well, notice, first of all, like we said, depending on your Bible translation here this morning, you may have any one of three words being used here in this passage. We have the word meek here in the ESV. That's why I asked Paul to read from that this morning. That's the one that we're all most familiar with. But, but if you have the NASB, you'll have the word gentle. Some people even have the word humble here. So meek, gentle, and humble. Why three possibilities? Well, that's because this word really includes all of those three concepts. This particular word in Greek is almost impossible to, to translate with just a single English word. One way we can start to understand this word is by looking at its opposites. Because meekness is really the opposite of two things. Greek philosophers used to think of this word like that. It's the opposite of two things. It's the opposite of being self-assertive. And it's the the opposite of being angry when our rights are violated. Most times that's when we get angry, right? We get angry because some right that we have has been crossed. It's been violated and so we respond in, in anger. We respond in harshness. And so meekness is really the, the opposite of self-assertive. It's the opposite of anger. <clears throat> Another way to understand this word is, of course, look it up in a dictionary. So uh, Chad and I did that this last week. We looked up several definitions of this word. And, and uh, one definition that, uh, that I really like is this. The meek person does not assert themselves over others in order to further their own agendas in their own strength. Let me read that again. The meek person does not assert themselves over others in order to further their own agendas in their own strength. Now, this is a really important aspect of this word because what I want you to see is this third beatitude really grows on the foundation, grows out of the foundation of the first. The first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit. As we said, this is the intellectual awareness of our spiritual poverty. The second beatitude goes one step further. Blessed are those who mourn over their spiritual poverty. And so there's an emotional response to our spiritual poverty. We mourn our poverty. Now, when we get to the third beatitude, it takes it one step further again. And it speaks of the relational aspects of our spiritual poverty. The relational aspect of our poverty. When you understand that you are a beggar in spirit, when you really mourn over the sin in your life, then this will bear itself out in your relationships with others. Meekness is really a relational word. One writer says it like this, Meekness is a quiet and friendly composure which does not become angry or embittered towards unpleasant people or unpleasant circumstances. 
And notice here that meekness is not just an outward behavior. See what Jesus says, he, well, he, what he doesn't say, he doesn't say blessed are those who show meekness. Rather, it's an internal quality reflected out in our behavior. He said, blessed are the meek. Meekness is not a man-made quality. But rather, Paul tells us in Galatians 5 that this quality is only possible through the fruit that the Spirit produces in our lives. It's not a natural quality. We're not born with this. And we can't develop this on our own. The only way we can grow meekness is out of a renewed nature. God has to make you a new person first. He has to give you a new heart first. And then you can start to manifest this quality in your life. And that's why it's such a great test as to whether or not you're in Jesus' spiritual kingdom. Because you can't conjure this up on your own. You can't be this apart from the work of the Spirit in your life. And I really want to flesh this, this word out and be more specific about what it means to be meek. Because as I said, this, this word is a relational word. And, and meekness really demonstrates itself in two kinds of relationships in our life. Meekness really demonstrates itself in two relationships in our lives. First of all, in our relationship with God. And secondly, in our relationship with others. And we're going to take those apart individually. So first, what does meekness or gentleness look like in relation to our relationship with God? Well, in our relationship with God, meekness really demonstrates itself or expresses itself primarily in submission. Meekness is displayed when we show submission to God in two particular ways. Firstly, when we submit to God's will in our circumstances, the meek person will show a calm acceptance of their circumstances as from God and for their good. Let me say that again. A meek person will show a calm acceptance of their circumstances as from God for their good. And because it's for their good, they remain calm. They refuse to become angry or resentful towards God because of their circumstances. Meekness really accepts God's dealing without resistance as absolutely good and absolutely wise. So that to say, if you are truly a meek person, you will submit to God's will in your life. Think of a wonderful biblical example of this is in the Old Testament story of, of the person of Eli in 1 Samuel chapter 3. If you remember the story, Eli is not rebuking his sons for their rebellion. His sons continue on in blatant and gross disobedience to the Lord and, and to their father. And at the same time, Eli has this young protege, the young boy prophet Samuel, Hannah's son. And if you remember this story, it's one of the Sunday school stories. We all love it. Um, young Samuel is, is fast asleep and, and he's in the temple and, and he hears a voice and voice calling out to him. And so he runs over to Eli to check on Eli and see what's going on. And Eli tells him, go back to bed. And, uh, and so it happens three more times or, or three times in, in total. And, and, and eventually Samuel does go down and, and quiets himself and, and allows the, the Lord to speak. And, and, uh, and the Lord does. And the Lord tells him primarily what he's going to do to Eli's sons. Now, when they wake up in the morning, Eli knows that God has spoken to Samuel. And so he says, Samuel, tell me everything. Tell me what the Lord has told you. Tell me what God said to you. And in 1 Samuel 3.18, we read this. So Samuel told everything to Eli and hid nothing from him. Now, whilst Eli had sinned in not rebuking his sons, here he really manifests this response to, to God's will. He really manifests this, this meekness to God's will, this acceptance of God's will. Can you imagine if you'd just been told by Samuel by anyone, that God was about to destroy your children because of their rebellion? That's incredibly difficult news to hear from anyone. 
But listen to what Eli says. Verse 18 of chapter 3, he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. That is the response of a meek heart before God. We can also see this this aspect of submission to God's will back in Psalm 37. It's a psalm that this this beatitude is, is, is based upon. Turn with me there for a moment if you have your Bible. Psalm 37. David is writing to Israelites who are in a difficult situation. And he says, verse 7, Verse 7, David says, Rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carried out wicked schemes. So, what's David saying here? He's saying that you're being attacked, you're being wronged. Now, how do we normally respond to that kind of thing in our life? We respond with anger, right? But look at verse 8. Cease from anger and forsake wrath and do not fret. Those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. In a little while, the wicked man will be no more. Verse 11, here's our passage. The meek will inherit the land. So when you find yourself in difficult and trying circumstances, what is the meek response? It's to trust in God to wait patiently on him, to cease from anger in response to what has happened, and instead submit to God's will, no matter how difficult or trying these circumstances are. The meek person will submit to God's will in their circumstances. Another way that the meek person can submit to God is by showing submission to his word. The same word that Jesus uses here in the Beatitudes is also found in a, in a rather unusual place, a, a place I'd read over several times without paying too much attention. That's in James chapter 1. Open up with me there if you have your Bibles. James chapter 1. The writer here in, in James, he's, uh, he's, he's building a case all about the centrality of the Scriptures. And in the middle of this section, verse 19 He says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear. That is, quick to hear the Scriptures. You must be slow to speak. That is, slow to argue with the Scriptures. When the Scriptures inevitably confront sin, what is something that happens? We get angry, right? And so so James says, be slow to anger. And then finally, James goes through and he says, The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and wickedness in meekness, there's our word, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. So don't get angry. Don't argue with God. Receive his word with a submissive heart. If it confronts something in your life, don't rebut against that. See it as from the Lord. So firstly, meekness is displayed in our relationship with God, both through submission to His will in our lives, in our circumstances, and in submission to His word in our lives. But secondly, how does meekness display itself in our relationship with others? How does meekness express itself in our relationship with those who are around us? Well, really, meekness expresses itself in a humble and a gracious and a gentle spirit. And here's the key, even when we are wronged. That's the circumstances in which this word really kicks in. Meekness accepts opposition. Meekness accepts insult. Meekness accepts provocation. Ephesians 4 verse 2, Paul says, In the church we are to respond to one another with all humility and gentleness or meekness, with patience, showing tolerance to one another in love. 
Colossians 3.12, he says, As those who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, and meekness, gentleness. When we confront each other's sin, when we see another believer in sin and we go and confront them on this issue, Galatians 6.1 says, Brethren, even if someone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a spirit of gentleness, of meekness. One example I really love of, of meekness is, is in the man Moses. We said it, we talked about him already. And if you remember back in Numbers chapter 12, when Moses responds to the attack on his authority by Miriam and by Aaron. They're really questioning Moses' authority. They're questioning if Moses was the right one to lead Israel. And right in this, the middle of this section is that famous verse. It says, now the man Moses was very meek, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. So Moses here, he's, he's being wronged. Moses' leadership is being questioned by his own siblings. But instead of getting angry, Instead of blowing up, he responds with meekness. He was gentle. He waited for the Lord to deal with this circumstance. We see, an, see another quality, uh, another example of what this quality looks like back in Genesis 13. Turn back with me to Genesis 13. We're going to do a bit of Bible flicking for a little bit. Genesis chapter 13. He is meekness in the life of Abraham. Genesis 13, verse 5. Now Lot, that's Abraham's nephew, Abraham's nephew, who went with him, also had flocks and herds and tents. And the land couldn't sustain them while dwelling together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Verse 8, see what Abraham did. Lot, get in line. Lot, God gave me this land. You take a hike. You buzz off to the next field. This is, this is my land. No, look how meekness responds. Please let there be no strife between you and me, for we are brothers. If you choose the left, I'll choose the right. If you choose the right, I'll choose the left. And it's a humble and a gracious and a gentle spirit being displayed. Another example of this is in Genesis chapter 26. This time from the life of Isaac, and it's to do with wells, the wells of contention. Chapter 26, verse 18 says, Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham. And he gave them the same name that his father had given them. So understand, these, these wells are, are, are Isaac's by, by right. His dad was the one that, that dug them. But when the servants of Isaac dug in the valley and found their well of flowing water, the herdsmen of Gerar argued with the herdsmen of Isaac, saying, This water is ours. And so Isaac named the place Contention, because they contended with him there. So Isaac said, Guys, take a hike. These are my wells. My dad dug these wells. They're mine. No, look how meekness responds. Verse 21, they dug another well and they argued over that one too. It's like these guys are just following Isaac around going, that's one, that one's mine, that one's mine, that one's mine, I want that one too. Verse 22, he moved away from there and dug another well and finally they didn't quarrel over it. And Isaac says, at last the Lord has made room for us both and we will be fruitful in the land. This is what a meek and a humble and a gentle spirit looks like in real life. Another example, this time from the life of David. Most of us have gone through this passage in, in recent times in, in home group. 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 5. This is after David is fleeing from Absalom for his life. He's been kicked out of the kingdom. Verse 5 says, When King David came to Baharim, behold, there came out from the man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei. And Shimei came out cursing continually, throwing stones at David and all the mighty men who were at his right and who were at his left. So picture this for a moment. 
David is surrounded here by all his mighty warriors, his, his mighty men. He's been seriously disrespected. Shimei even starts calling him names. Verse 7, get out, you man of bloodshed, you worthless fellow. So Shimei is being pretty disrespectful of King David here. Now, if you were the king, what would you do in response to this situation? You're the king, you're surrounded by all your, your greatest warriors either side. And there's this little pipsqueak over here who's calling you names. But I love this passage because it actually gives us two responses to the situation. First, how not to respond. Then Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse the king, my lord? Let me go over now and cut off his head. Just for the record, that's the opposite of meekness, right? <laughs> See David's response here. David says, What have I to do with you, O son of Zeruiah? If he curses, and if the Lord has told him, curse David, then who shall say, why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son Absalom, who came from me, seeks my life. How much more this Benjaminite? Let him alone curse, for the Lord has told him. Perhaps the Lord will look on my affliction and return good to me instead of his cursing this day. You see what David does here in this situation? He says, God is sovereign. God is in control of the circumstances and of this person. I don't have to get angry. I don't have to defend my honor, my reputation, my rights. This is the response of a meek heart. Another example, perhaps the greatest example of all is, is our Lord Jesus Christ. He perfectly displayed this quality of meekness, right? In 2 Corinthians 10, Paul tells us that of, of the gentleness of Christ using this exact same word. But one of the, the greatest pictures of Christ's meekness, I think, is found in 1 Peter chapter 2. Flick over there with me. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. See, this is the, exa this, the example of Christ, the, the example of Christ's meekness. Verse 21 of Peter chapter 2 says, Jesus committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. While being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. But he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he went on to bear our sins in his body on the tree. What Peter's saying here is, is Jesus expressed perfect gentleness, perfect meekness with those who are killing him. And in the middle of it, he says, Father, forgive them. Luke's gospel tells us. After all those examples that, that we love that, that we've looked through this morning. The one thing that I love about meekness is this is the quality that Jesus actually shows to each one of us. You remember that famous passage in Matthew chapter 11? It says, Come unto me, all who are weary and uh, who are labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke, learn from me. And then he says this, For I am am gentle. This is how Jesus responds to us. Not like we deserve, not with an outburst of, of anger. How often do we sin and we deserve for, for God to respond to us in anger? But he doesn't do that. Instead, he responds to us with humble and gentle graciousness. So what is meekness? The person who is meek remains calm and in control regardless of how much somebody else is provoking them. The meek person doesn't insist on their own rights. The meek person doesn't respond with, with, with sinful anger. They don't, the meek person doesn't harbor bitterness. They don't seek revenge. They don't, see, they don't treat others with harshness. Now, of course, if that is true, which it is, then the opposite is also true, right? 
if you refuse to submit to God's will in your circumstances, if you argue with God, if you get angry with God because of the situation you are facing, if you refuse to submit to his word when it confronts your life, if you always respond to others with a spirit of harshness, when your rights get violated, if you respond with anger, then there is serious cause to question whether you are truly part of Jesus' spiritual kingdom. Let me ask you this very simple question this morning. Are you meek? Do you live out meekness in your life? When circumstances get hard and difficult, how do you respond to God? When trials come, and and they do come, we all know that. Do you really believe that God is sovereign over all things, working all things for your good? What about when people are wrong, have wronged you in your life? Can you, do you show gentleness, a gentle, gracious, humble spirit towards them in those occasions? So to submit to God's will and God's word and to have a humble and a gentle spirit towards others, even when they wrong you, that is what meekness must look like in our lives. Let us briefly consider a a second point this morning as we start to wrap up. We've looked at the meaning of meekness. That was the first question. But what about the second half of Jesus' statement here in verse 5? What does Jesus promise to the meek? He says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Notice how Jesus says it there. They shall inherit. They shall inherit the earth. You see, Jesus here is looking forward. This is a future blessing that Jesus is promising here. Now, straight away, as soon as we hear this promise, right, it's pretty countercultural. It's a pretty shocking statement from our Lord here because that's not the way things normally work in this world. Really, it should be the opposite. The meek are the, the meek and the gentle. They get nowhere in this world. They're, they're the ones that they get trodden on. You have to be overpowering. You have to be overbearing to be successful in this world. But Jesus says, no, no, no. It's the meek. It's the gentle who are going to inherit the earth. What does Jesus mean here by inherit the earth? Well, remember back to the context of the entire sermon, right? It's kingdom life, kingdom living. Remember right now, as as Jesus said to Pilate in John 18, my kingdom is not of this world. So the kingdom as it stands right now is a spiritual kingdom. It's a present reality, right? The kingdom is right now. It exists But there are aspects of that kingdom that will be fulfilled at a later time. The reign of God. Aspects that are still in the future. There is a coming day when Jesus will establish a literal geopolitical earthly kingdom. As per Zechariah 14. As per Daniel 9. As per Revelation chapter 20. And so... If this promise shall take place in the future, then Jesus must be referring here to the new earth. The new earth on which all who are truly part of his spiritual kingdom will one day live. But there's also another reason why, this, this, why Jesus here must be referring to a future recreated earth. And that is because that's also the context that fits best with, with Psalm 37, the psalm on which this beatitude is based. If you, read Psalm, if you read Psalm 37, some five or six times, the psalmist contrasts those who will be cut off, meaning they will be destroyed. They will be separated from God's presence. He's talking about eternal destruction versus those who will dwell in the land. Not only a reference to the land of Israel, but to dwelling in the future literal place where God will rule and reign. He's talking about the new heavens and the new earth. So what Jesus is saying here is is this, the meek, they already belong to Jesus' spiritual kingdom. But there is a day coming when they will also inherit a place in Jesus' literal, physical kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a wonderful promise to me. The meek, they're already his, they already belong to him, but they will be with him forever in eternity. 
But remember, the opposite is also true, right? Those who refuse to submit to God's will and God's word, those who are always defending their rights, their personal rights in anger, they will not inherit the new heavens and the new earth. Instead, spending an eternity separate from God's goodness, God's glory. I'm not making this up. It's exactly what Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. Those who manifest outbursts of anger defending their rights, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. So don't fool yourself this morning. Understand this, I'm, I'm not saying that as Christians we can't sin in this way. I'm not saying that we can't have outbursts of, of anger. But what I am saying is there is, there is not an unbroken, unrepentant pattern of this sin in our lives. So as we come into land this morning, what are some take-homes for us? What are some specific ways that we can use this beatitude in our lives? What do we do with this beatitude this morning? Firstly, like the others, this beatitude is to be used as a test. A test of whether or not you are truly in Jesus' spiritual kingdom. As if you are truly poor in spirit, if you truly mourn over the sin in your life, then this will be true of you this morning. As a pattern of life, you will not become angry or embittered towards God for difficult circumstances. Why can't you get angry? Because you're poor in spirit. You know that you don't deserve anything good apart from God's grace in your life. And in the same way, if you come to realize that you are poor in spirit, if you come to mourn over your sin, then this will be true. As a pattern of life, you will not get angry or bitter at the people who wrong you. Why? Because they are simply acting like you would apart from God's grace in your life. So these Beatitudes, they're a, they're a wonderful test for us this morning. But there's also other practical uses of these Beatitudes. For those who are already in Jesus' kingdom, we need to cultivate this quality. It's present in us, yes, but we need to grow in it. We need to cultivate it. So how do we get meekness? Well, Galatians 5 says, firstly, it's the Spirit's work within us. Only the Spirit can produce this, this quality in us. But what can we do to cultivate the Spirit's growth of this in our lives? First of all, how about asking God to do it, right? Come in prayerful humbleness before the Lord, humility before the Lord. Ask the Spirit of God to increase meekness in your life. Ask the Spirit of God to increase gentleness. We don't do this often enough. Ask the Lord to do things in our life before Him. There's another way as well. How were the Israelites in Psalm 37, of which David wrote in, in difficult and trying circumstances, how were they supposed to grow in their meekness? I encourage you this week, have a read of Psalm 37, because again and again in this psalm, Israel are told if they develop a deep trust in God's sovereignty in their life, it will allow them to respond against the people who wronged them in the right way. If you want to cultivate meekness in your life, then develop a growing awareness and trust in God's sovereign power. How do you do that? By reading His Word, by studying His Word, by being in fellowship with other like-minded believers, coming along to church, coming along to home groups together, hearing about what God is doing in each other's lives. Start by praying, praying and seeing what God will do. That will increase trust in your life. I was thinking yesterday, yesterday about this particular quality and, and how to apply it. And I was thinking, sometimes it can be easier even to, to show meekness in the bigger things in our life. Someone, someone wrongs us and, and we turn the other cheek, right? Most of us can do that and praise God for that. That's a wonderful thing. But, but what about displaying meekness in some of these smaller areas in our lives? 
Think about showing meekness in these circumstances. Say you're in a conversation with somebody here at church, with a friend, with family, with your spouse, and you're in this conversation with them and, and uh, you're speaking and perhaps their facts don't quite line up. Perhaps they know less about a particular subject than you do. What is your reaction to them? Do you respond by asserting yourself, by being louder than, than they are? Do you have to interrupt and correct them on every little last detail? Or can you allow them to, to finish, to finish what they're saying and then have a discussion about it together? That's a small and a practical way. What about this example? You get to the end of a, of a long week. I know I'm certainly guilty of this. You get to the end of a long week. You're tired and you, you think, oh, okay, I deserve a little bit of me time now. I've worked really hard. I deserve some me time. And, and it's my right to sit down and, and have a, a, some quiet time to myself. But then the kids wake up and they start to pester and, and bother you. You get an unexpected visitor you get asked to attend or, or help with something, or perhaps you even become unwell and you get sick that night at the end of a long week. What's your reaction to this scenario? Do you display meekness and gentleness? Or do you get angry because your night has been disrupted, because it's been interrupted? You know, this quality of meekness, like all the fruit of the Spirit, is closely intertwined with each other. It's not just meekness at the expense of, of all others. Meekness is very much tied into aspects like self-control. Ask yourself, how do I display meekness in my marriage? Men, can we be gentle in leading our wives, but at the same time, lead them, lead them biblically? How do you display meekness in your parenting? Are you gentle in your parenting? Are there things you need to ask for forgiveness for from your spouse, from your partner, from your family? And another thing as well about meekness, displaying meekness doesn't mean that we can't show discerning leadership or, or godly assertiveness. But we have to ask ourselves, when we do assert ourselves, what is our motivation in this? Is pride the motivation for what I am doing? Is it just because I want to get my own way in this, because I know I'm right? Or do you come before those situations with a humble and a gentle heart, willing to give up your right, willing to give up your opinion? And the final way I want to think about this beatitude this morning, if you sit here this morning and you know that meekness is not a quality that you possess, may this beatitude be a reminder of why we all so desperately need Jesus Christ in our life. Of everything that we've looked at today, living this out perfectly at all times, that's God's standard, right? That's God's standard. You want to earn your way to heaven? You have to live out meekness perfectly at all times. It's impossible to do. It's an impossible standard to keep. And so what is our hope? Well, our hope can only be in the one who did live this out perfectly. The one who offers forgiveness through his death on Calvary. If you repent of your sin, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will do this today. He'll forgive your sin. He'll give you a new heart and enable you to manifest this quality of of meekness, both towards him and towards the people who are around us. Blessed are the meek. Let's pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. Father, we confess that, uh, that daily, weekly, we, we fall short of your perfect standard. We do not display this quality as we ought to in our lives. We react to you, to our circumstances, with harshness, with anger, with frustration. Father, convict us of this, we pray. Use your spirit in our lives to, to work, to grow, to cultivate this quality in us. Help us to be made more like your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, each and every day. Father, we thank you for this. It is in your name we pray. Amen.